Hey guys, is Cuphead a good game? Cuphead is incredible for more than just its Makes every shot you land feel like a minor victory. Its utterly unique style makes it an instant breath of fresh air. Everyone seems to love Cuphead, although it does have a few minor problems that bring it down from that. Ten out of ten territory. Oh my god, And no. a very no, easy, badass no, seal. This is going to be an extensive look at Cuphead and talking about its fandom. <laughs> because of this, the video is going to be split into two separate parts. The first, reviewing the game itself, and the second part, reviewing the fandom, among other things. I was originally going to make these topics into two separate videos, but instead, I'll leave timestamps here. So you can jump straight to the part that you're most interested in. In short, this is where we bully the game. And this is where we bully children. Nope! Not yet. You need to eat your greens before you get the pudding. Cuphead is extraordinary and it feels like we only got it by the skin of our teeth. We made that by the skin of our teeth. <laughs> Alright, that was a bit hyperbolic, but still, Cuphead is an amazing game. You'll come for the style and most probably stay for the substance. Because I can safely say for the most part, the gameplay of Cuphead matches up with the aesthetic. Gorgeously animated in homage to the downright hypnotically inducing animations of the 1930s. The game originally began development in 2010. Just to put in perspective how long ago that was, Ray William Johnson was the undeclared king of YouTube and Bed Intruder was going viral. You don't have a call, it's a fest. Really looking for you. We go find you. We go find you. Now I know that seven years doesn't sound like a lot, especially game development wise, because a lot of games that are held as classics today took even longer to craft. Welcome to Team Fortress 2. After nine years in development, hopefully it will have been worth the wait. But my point is, games that continuously get delayed usually follow one of two roads. Firstly, the Path of Ascension, where your game becomes an instant classic, adored by many for its blend of atmosphere, non-linear storytelling, and breaking conventions to bring something new to the table. At this point, all you have to be worried about is people saying your game is too good and saying it's overrated. Hey everyone, it's your boy Branded95 here, making video on why Bioshock suck. You see these pipes? Clearly, they stole these from Mario. And these robots here? Clearly, they stole it from the film Wally. -E. Thank you all for watching, and be sure to like and subscribe for my gift card giveaway. And secondly, you have the Path of Blight. A cold, dark, and miserable place where delayed games were crushed. <coughs> Under the pressure of fluctuating budgets, psychopathic producers, and downsizing. Downsizing? Yeah, I have no problem with that. I've been recommending downsizing since I first got here. Wait, is that the holding perfect dot zero? Now's our chance before she can reload! Now, Cuphead was slated for release in 2015, then pushed to 2016, and finally in 2017, we're able to experience it in its full cup loving glory. And what can I say about the game? Well, <laughs> I, I actually haven't even finished it. You see, there, there's just one boss. He, he's very hard. All right, listen, I've been stuck on that for such a long time. So, yeah, I haven't played the full game yet. Uh, here's a quick montage of me completing it. Is that, is that a human? Got some Pinocchio looking at, okay. To, should I even carry on? I'll carry on. I'm gonna carry on. All right, let's just keep for Jesus Christ, fuck. Hey guys, it's Dark Side Phil. Whoa, what is that? What is it? It's like a floating ass. All right, it just died. I'm sure the wiki will give a very descriptive uh, backstory. This ain't too hard to dodge, to be fair. Just keep moving in. The yeah, that, that weren't even that hard to dodge. Okay. What the fuck? Why did it come from that direction? There, there was no indication. Oh my god. Oh my god. <laughs> you guys remember that really gay music video from a couple years ago? Showing like the Twitter bird basically destroying society and ruining lives. This is that bird. We got this. We got this. Okay, we got this. 
One in the chat if we got this. I am a pirate living by the sea. I have homosexual tendencies. Wow, okay. All right, mate, we get it. All right, I need seven eyes. I need seven eyes. I cannot. I mean, the game ain't too hard. You know, you just got to kind of concentrate on your surroundings. And then you'll be fine. <laughs> can you can hear dogs barking? Shut up, dogs. Oh my god, the dogs. Shut up. Why do the dogs do damage? They're not even real! They're, sh they're targets! They're stationary targets! Why do they damage you? What the f- Why can you just like- Are you done? No, of course you're not done. Right, okay. You're moving in the opposite direction now. <laughs> oh, Jesus Christ! I'm the fucking hurricane! It's time for the super. How do I use the super? There we go. Alright. <sighs> oh my god. He's got like little- Flame members throwing themselves towards me. Oh wow, that was that was actually a really crap bus. All right, oh what the fuck? <laughs> is that a shark? That's a shark. Oh, get back in the ocean, bitch! Is that is that is that a dogfish? That's a dogfish. That's not even a real. That's a work of fiction. All right, I'm looking for a two, three, two. Wait, wait. I'm, I'm a, I got this calculator. Three, two, three, three. What? What the? F three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two. <laughs> wow, that was actually a that was a really embarrassing attack move. Oh, oh! What did I take? I'm blah, I'm blah, so, I'm a right, I should I should probably go. Was there an axe? You're the devil! Oh my meant to die! Oh I dodged it, okay. You know what? I kinda overreacted a little bit there. That wasn't even that bad. That was yeah, where'd, the, where'd the sailor go? Oh rip. Oh rip. <laughs> Why am I even fighting at this point? <laughs> <laughs> what? Why was I meant to avoid? Yeah, I don't kill you. I don't kill you. I don't care. Stop doing that. Is there a way I can just like throw myself in the ocean? <coughs> Why are the clouds moving towards him? No! That was so scummy, sir. I have to say. Hey, I heard you managed to parry four times in a row. I'll bet you're so proud you could bust. You can bust a nut on your face. <laughs> so let me, let me, let me just get rid of these things. There we go. Stop doing that! <laughs> what? There, there's another face. Holy Jesus Christ! Ooh. You ain't nothing, kid. You ain't nothing. You think you're something, but you nothing. You nothing. You ain't no one. You ain't no man. I am my own man. I got no problems with you, sir. <laughs> How far was I? It's good. Actually, it's beyond good. It's amazing. So much effort has been put into Cuphead, and when I mean effort, I mean EFFORT! Not the lowercase version, mind. That's reserved for your mate, Peter. That unironically thinks the Kinect was the best choice Microsoft have ever made. Because that thing in our hands, that thing that's evolved in our hands and got more and more complex and got more and more buttons, actually has been the biggest barrier. Because what we want to create is a connection to our worlds. And that's what I believe Natal does. What designers and what this industry does with Natal will change the landscape of games that we play. You know, Connect. I'll be honest, it was a disaster. It was a disaster, right? Cuphead is a game crafted by people who cared about their product. The creators, Charit and Jad Moldenhauer. Where am I? Am I saying that right? Moldenhauer. Oh, hell yeah. They cared deeply about this game and took the steps to make sure that people were talking about it years after it was released. When the first trailer for Cuphead was released all the way back in 2015, it blew people away. But some critics said the game simply just looked like a boss rush mode. And back in 2015, yeah, that's exactly what the game was going to be. The truth is that we started Cuphead as a three-person team, just working on the weekend. With such a small team, we knew to keep our scope small. There were just a few bosses and a couple of weapons and everything was less insane. After which the brothers remortgaged both their houses putting themselves in the red. Subscribe and like if you want. 
and with their new capital, they could expand the scope of their game. Now, in comparison, just think of all the game devs that made a Kickstarter to fund their game, then called it a day when the money started rolling in. From what started as a fun boss rush game is now a much larger canvas. Sure, the bosses are still the main selling point of the game, but there's so much more now. Run and gun sections, fighting an onslaught of smaller foes, overworld exploration, packed full of shortcuts. There are loads of secrets to be found and even characters to interact with in some much needed downtime. Something Studio MDHR could have never achieved without taking that massive risk, putting their houses on the line. And probably selling their souls to the devil, you know? I mean... <laughs> They probably did. Now, although the game is a triumph, especially in its visual department, I wouldn't call it a masterpiece because it's just not. There's a fair few problems in this game that definitely drag it down, but that's something I'll talk about later. Keep in mind, I love Cuphead. It's an amazing game, but if you're giving it a 10 out of 10, you're an idiot, all right? You are dumb. Stop it. IGN, I saw that 10, change it. Go on. In Cuphead, you players. Well, Cuphead. I mean, you could play as Mugman, but the game's only local co-op at the moment. There's a way you can play as Mugman in single player, but then you'd have to call the game Mugman. Anyways, the game takes place in Inkwell Isle, a world full of young cups, old kettles, and Satan. Makes sense, right? The two protagonists, Cuphead and Mugman, find themselves far from home and enter the Devil's Casino. They find themselves on a winning streak at gambling, getting the attention of the Devil, who makes them an offer. Win one more time and all the loot in the casino is theirs, but if they fail, the Devil will take their soul. Honestly, that's one of the worst punishments imaginable. Unable to escape a living hell. No, 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 get it out! And of course, they take the Devil's offer and fail miserably. I mean, what would happen if they didn't? Cuphead, do deal with the devil, because now we're rich and we're making Player Unknown's Battlegrounds 2. The FPS is better, we swear. The brothers plead for another option. The devil sways, saying that if they collect every soul contract indebted to him, the brothers may own a pardon. Basically, he's the self declared judge, and he's offering these two legal immunity for helping him with the case. It's kind of like Judge Dredd. <laughs> It's not. Get on your knees. Oh, that was a the two rush back to Elder Kettle who gives them a potion to buff up their vigor, which also gives them the beginning firing type. And then the brothers begin their journey on an epic quest to right wrongs by helping the devil. I don't know. Anyway, is it brothers or brother? The NPCs are just as confused. They always talk as the two of you are there, even though I'm playing this on my own. I guess everyone's just got double vision. When will my Alternatively, before beginning your quest, you can opt for the tutorial, which is a real test of endurance. It's like the seven day survivor achievement from Dead Rising, but instead of seven days, it's seven months, or years. Where am I? I need to find my family. What in the world? Please help me. Subscribe to Dolan Dark. Inkwell Isle, the land where the game takes place, is split up into four areas. The first is a forest-themed area with buses accompanying the theme, like garden vegetables, plants, and animals. You know, I I got no idea what this is, but the, the boy throws a mean punch. <laughs> to be honest, I've never liked boxing gloves. Every time I have a run-in with them, they just bring me misery. What is this? Looks like a boxing glove. <laughs> The first aisle reminds me of most opening worlds for platformers, cheery and bright. But in Cuphead's world, it's even more deceptive than you'd find in most games, as everything here is out to kill you. Except the onion. He he just cries a lot. You feel it too, don't you? I'm gonna make him give back our past. The second island's theme is more like a fair or carnival. It has bosses like clowns. Exontes. Genies and dra dragons. She, she guys, it's just it's just like Dark Souls. They 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 both have dragons. The third aisle is more like a city with tall skyscrapers owned by bees. Theater players run by psychotic killers and a pirate living on the coastline. You know the usual. Oh, did I mention Medusa as well? I I I'm, I'm the Iron Giant. 
Oh, and Majora's Mask. The only way to transition between each of these aisles is through the Die House, where you meet King Dice, who gives you an update on your progress. Also, just listen to that music. I'm Mr. King Dice. I'm the gamest in the land. I never play nice. I'm the devil's right hand man. This is just a level transition, and you can feel how much effort they've put into these areas alone, with unique visuals, music, and an animated King Dice to boot. Although one thing I found weird is how animated everything is in-game, but during the very few cutscenes, everything is a still image. It kind of contradicts the point of having everything lively and animated, but it's more of a nitpick than anything else. The fourth and final island is less of an island, more like a giant casino, where you battle the devil's lackey, and then finally, the big boy himself. It's actually quite ironic that fighting the devil is probably the most normal thing about this game. Every night, I can feel my neck. And now the setup is out of the way, I just want to make something clear. Cuphead will kick your ass. I've drawn a chart of this game's difficulty, and I'd say it's at least 100% accurate. You're gonna die in this game. A lot. And Cuphead has mechanics put in place to alleviate the horrible pain of failure, and also to keep pushing you to make progress. Whether that's the progress bar being shown motivating you to get up again and tackle that boss because you were just so close, the mocking message a boss gives you when you die, giving you that thirst for revenge just to shut him up. God, I just... Or the fact each stage, except this one, is incredibly short, being just a few minutes long, so failure doesn't leave that lasting stain like an endurance boss fight. Every enemy, every projectile, every color of every enemy and every projectile has to be analyzed with pinpoint accuracy. And this is where the animation comes in and how it works so perfectly with the game. Cuphead's art style is heavily influenced by early 1900s cartoons, such as Fleischer Studios, Disney, and Ben 10. <laughs> Cartoons in their early days were a new spectacle, something you'd go to see because it was something fairly new and everyone was talking about it. And ironically, nearly a hundred years later, this same effect is applied to Cuphead. There has never been anything like Cuphead style in a video game developed for this intention. I mean, sure there are other games out there like Bendy, using the classic early Disney style, but Cuphead is totally disconnected from the horror genre, where Bendy's monsters have to be purposely contorted and horrific looking to scare the player, Cuphead's foes can move with vigor and vibe, much like the cartoons of old used to. Both of these games are juxtapositions, using the family-friendly association of early cartoons in the art style. But the actual game being either horror or straight or brutal in its difficulty, either of which you wouldn't think of when seeing a 1930s animation, and that is just genius. Cuphead capitalizes on an art style called rubber hosing. This can be defined by characters constant flowing curves without hinged body parts. Parts of your body that simply can't bend, but with Cuphead, pretty much everything has an ebb and flow to it, making the game world feel even more animated and alive, and this is one of Cuphead's biggest strengths, and that is the art style. Every single character in Cuphead is hand-drawn. I swear, these guys were just on a quest to punish themselves, and you know what? It was totally worth it. The payoff, I mean? Not punishing yourself, that's bad. Oi, I put that, put that down, don't even go. Oh my god. Everything in this game just jumps out at you. All of it's animated in 24 frames a second you'd see in traditional animation. Meanwhile, the game itself runs at a silky 60. It's this perfect bridge between old cartoons of the early 1900s and video game standards today. Keep in mind, each boss has multiple attacks and multiple phases with their own sets of attacks, meaning hundreds of frames are needed needed for each boss. Basically, being an animator sucks. Everything just pops in this game, especially the bosses, making bombastic animations, letting the player know if they're going to perform a telegraphed attack or moving to the next phase of their fight. Some of these moments are definitely better demonstrated than others though. I noticed myself taking damage multiple times because even though I was safe from enemy damage, I'd still get hit regardless. You can clearly tell how much they cared about the visuals of the game also including all the little stuff as well. When Browse 
browsing the overworld map of the game, you can tell what can be interacted with and what can't, with boss areas sketched over multiple times to form a jiggling animation loop, giving the areas clear definition from the rest of the watercolor painted background. Even at the end of the game, after collecting all the soul contracts, you have the choice of joining the devil, a totally defunct choice that you know will undo all the progress you made to get here, but the choice is still there. By the way, I did pick this option first, and no, it doesn't delete your save like some people are saying. It just plays the credits with a sadder tone, hammering that stupid choice you made. Then puts you right back outside the devil's house, giving you another option to fight him and conclude the game proper. It's just nice to see that the guys at Studio MDHR put in all this effort into the smaller stuff that most people wouldn't even notice on their first run. I mean, look at this turtle, for instance. He's on the dock, and most players would approach him from the left, because it's the most simple, and there's no point walking on a bridge that goes nowhere just to talk to the guy. I tried going on his right side, expecting him to look again on the left, like he dropped his glasses or something, but instead he actually turned his head to look at me, even though I'm sure next to no players would approach him from this angle. Wait, hold up a second, what, what was I talking about again? Oh yeah, the difficulty. Unless you're some sort of gamer god that refers to your PC as my battle station, you're going to die in Cuphead a lot. The game is comprised of three main stages. Run and gun sections where you run a gauntlet from start to finish, fighting smaller foes and collecting coins. The aforementioned boss fights and an aerial variant of said boss fight. The run and gun sections first, they function much like run and gun games of old like Contra, where the objective isn't necessarily to kill the enemies, more just make it to the end of the stage. Some of the later run and gun stages do have mini bosses of sorts that you have to fight to proceed. Well, have to with very large quotation marks. As in these stages, there's usually always a way to avoid every single enemy. This is usually the hardest way to complete these levels, and Cuphead fully acknowledges that, rewarding you with a P for pacifist rank if you complete any of these stages without firing a shot. One problem I have with these run and gun stages is the lack of flow or overall rhythm. When playing these levels, I never felt like I was making actual progress or fighting increasingly difficult enemies. It felt very uncoordinated, almost like the devs slapped a bunch of random enemies together and said, Hey, good luck, man. And getting that coveted pacifist rank for these levels usually ended up with me constantly retrying over and over, hoping there was a hole in the enemy spawns this time, and most of it I was using specific power-ups to cheese the AI. Not to say I hated these stages, they were incredibly enjoyable, but I found a lot of the time I was dying at the midpoint of each stage, where the difficulty would spontaneously peak and not near the end where you should find the most resistance. This doesn't apply to the final run and gun stage, I'd always make it to the end and then get killed by one of those shrimps. <laughs> Although these sections of the game can be fun, they're definitely not the main focus of Cuphead. And I think the devs realized this as well, making the boss fights vastly outnumber the amount of run and gun levels. It's probably better to visualize the run and gun sections as side content to the game, as I think we can all agree that if the game was mostly run and gun stages with the occasional boss fight maybe at the end of each aisle, the game wouldn't get nearly as much praise. Thankfully that criticism about the run and gun stages doesn't really carry over to the boss fights in Cuphead, because these battles are out outstanding. Each one has their own tone and atmosphere, and I'm not just talking about the watercolor backdrops or the bosses themselves. I'm talking about the music. A brawl is surely brewing. When you enter a boss fight and that music slowly starts building up, it's one of the best experiences you can have in this game. They've put as much effort into crafting the music in this game as they have with the animation, and it is truly stellar stuff. Forming this amazing cocktail of animation and music, it all just blends together. I, I, I just love it so much. You can read the expressions on these guys' faces, and it's usually something along the lines of, I want you dead. Except the onion. He just cries. Again, why are you fighting him? Why? He doesn't even fight back. He, he cries. His tears attack you. That's messed up, man. Leave the kid alone. Most of them definitely have this evil, menacing appearance about them, extremely fitting as they've all dealt with the devil at one point or another. The animation plays into their attacks, but it's usually a double-edged sword, with some attacks being incredibly well telegraphed, giving you ample time to prepare and evade, to just this. <laughs> 
The aerial battles are similar by design, but you just have a more open canvas. These are usually reserved for larger bosses that take up a huge amount of the screen. In these sections, moving around as much as possible is definitely your go-to to surviving because you'll find many more projectiles to avoid here than anywhere else in the game. You could also turn into a micro plane to fly around quicker and evade faster. But the trade-off with this is your shots are about as effective as a poorly constructed hate video. Power Cynical sucks and uh, he sucks. Power Cynical sucks. In these arenas, you have two kinds of firing types, a barrage of missiles that does somewhat moderate damage. And as a secondary, you can drop bombs off as well. These have an incredibly short range, but do heavy damage if they make their target. Each of these also has a special move, with the barrage of missiles turning into a giant chomper that literally chomps through. I mean, look, it's just eating him. And the secondary attack dropping bombs fires a barrage of magnets that home in on their opponents. Fucking magnets, how do they work? As well as these two special attacks, if you fill up every single card in the super meter, you can unleash a mega attack. With this, you propel yourself as a gigantic bomb, and if you make your target, you recreate the Fallout intro. War. War never changes. Now, you're probably wondering if Cuphead and Mugman have any way to defend themselves, some sort of arsenal. Before talking strict weapons, Cuphead has the ability to parry certain enemy attacks. Wow, that's just like the, that other game, you know, the, the, the one that everyone keeps comparing it to? Yeah. You can parry by jumping up in the air and then hitting the jump button again. Cuphead's straw turns into a hand and high fives whatever he's trying to parry into oblivion. At times, both projectiles and enemies themselves can be parried. This can be incredibly useful for screen clearing, especially during bus fights when you can make the screen slightly less cluttered by parrying one of the enemy projectiles. Keep in mind you can only parry pink objects, so don't try to be a self-declared parry god because you'll die faster than the player base of lawbreakers. Xbox fanboys get really salty. When you begin the game proper, you're given this vigor, I mean potion from Elder Kettle. Just as a reminder, don't drink random liquid strangers give you. This potion gives you your starting power, the pea shooter, your basic workhorse. It has good range and decent damage to boot. Not the best of the pack, obviously, as it's your starting weapon, but it has the most minor drawback of any further firing type you'd acquire. Your special attack for this weapon, which you can fill by damaging baddies and also parrying things, you release a massive Hadouken in any direction for more damage. Each special uses up one card and you can hold up to five. Now, you can fill up all cards to unlock a super special special move, but I'll talk about that later. To acquire any more weapons, you'll need to visit the game shop, Pork Rinds Emporium, where you can buy more shot types as well as charms, which I'll get into later. No, 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 that kind of charm! Apart from your standard pea shooter, that's not a joke by the way, that's the actual name of the weapon, you can purchase five additional firing types from Pork Rind. Chaser, Lubber, Roundabout, Spread, and Charge. Chaser is by far the weakest DPS firing mode in the entire game. You fire discount Mario stars that home in on their target, much like children to a rice gum meetup. You can adopt a fire and forget technique with these. As long as you're holding the firing button, your shots should eventually connect with the target. Although what target you want to hit isn't always your choice, which I found out the hard way. This is definitely the firing type for helping people struggling with certain levels or bosses. As you don't need to concentrate on hitting your enemies as much, you can then dedicate your massive intelligence to platforming and avoiding enemy projectiles. To further back this up, the special attack of the chaser rounds forms a protective barrier around the player, helping them to prevent taking further damage. <laughs> Lava is up next, and quite a weird ammo type. You toss a large ball that bounces a couple feet before exploding. The range of these is complete garbage, but on the other hand, these shots do above average damage. The special attack for these is just throwing a larger version. That's it, really. I mean, if it helps, you could imagine their basketballs and your fresh prints. Now this is a story all about how my life got flipped, turned upside down, and I'd like to take a minute and just sit right there. I'll tell you how I became the prince of a town called Bel Air. Now let's take a trip down under, mates, because our next firing type is roundabout. With this potion, you're firing boomerangs at the bed. He's dealing average damage like an undercooked shrimp at the barbie. It's no but here's the catch, mate. If you're firing towards, your shots will retreat faster than the Germans retreated from Stalingrad.
But if you fire backwards, then your shots will fly towards your foes. Puts you at a bit of a disadvantage. But it is great for foes you gotta run away from. So you can put the focus on platforming and the boomerangs can focus on the killing. You know what I mean, mate? I'm never doing that again. I'm so sorry. Oh, I'm so sorry. And now for our final two shots and my personal favorites. Spread and charge. I, I just love them so much. Spread works much like a shotgun. <laughs> No, 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 not that kind of shotgun. You guys remember frag rounds from Battlefield 3? Before the patch? With spread, you fire five triangles of death with every shot. And much like a shotgun, range is key. The closer you are to an enemy, the more damage you'll inflict. And oh boy, if you're at point blank range, the bosses won't know what hit them. Your special attack for this is firing even larger triangles of death, or what I like to call mega triangles, in every single direction, ensuring at least one enemy is gonna get impaled by these bad boys. Seriously, with this firing type, you won't be jumping around a avoiding bosses like the plague, you'll be hugging them. Now obviously this works better with some enemies than others, and this is why spread isn't particularly my first choice, but my second. So whenever I'm about to jump on a level, I'll always put it in my backup slot, as you can switch from one firing type to a secondary on the fly. And now, Cupkin and Mugjender, allow me to present to you my first go-to firing type, charge. Seriously, charge shots? kick ass. I genuinely don't think Cuphead's devs understand how devastating this weapon is. Its drawback is that firing it uncharged is about as effective as YouTube trying to speak to its creators. We know you have a lot of questions about the subspeed on YouTube and we've decided to go straight to the source. Zinzi is the product manager on- But oh boy, when you charge this baby, it does immense damage. Here's a quick example of how effective it is. I was stuck on the matchstick bus. I died about 20 times just never able to kill the thing, and then I switched to charge shots. Killed him first try. Now obviously charge shots aren't perfect during smaller waves of enemies, most frequently found in the run and gun stages. Enemies usually die in one shot anyway, so it's kind of a waste. So what I usually do is combine spread and charge, so I could dominate pretty much any playing field. I don't know whether it was just my playstyle, but once I had the combo of spread and charge, I never felt the need to change up my shot types. They all just seem totally inferior compared to the raw damage charge shots and spread can do. And I never felt that the charge up time or the limited range was a problem for me. That moment when I beat Matchstick with my charge shots after failing so many times with other firing modes was an amazing one. Like I put the final piece in a puzzle and I just wish I had more moments like that. When a bus was decimating me over and over and switching to an ammo type I barely used gave me a massive upper hand during the fight. Not turning the bus into a cakewalk, mind you, but making you feel like you're having more of an impact than your last attempt. As well as shot types, Porcrine also sells charms. These are basically the game's perks. Sometimes even giving you unique attacks. You can only equip one of these at any time. Heart gives you an extra hit point of damage, but reduces your overall damage output by 5%. Twin Heart doubles the previous, giving you two additional hit points, meaning you can take up to five hits in the field before going down, but your damage is reduced by 10%. A lot of people refer to the hearts as the noob trap, but honestly, I don't see the problem with them. If you're getting beat over and over by a particular level, Level or bus, go ahead and use them. Even though you're a, you're a pussy. Coffee fills your super meter continuously, but honestly, I think it's easily the worst charm. I mean, just look at how slow that fills up. Three weeks later. Hey, I'm hot. Oh, oh, it's still charging. I see. Okay, I tell you what, I'll be back in a month. Okay, J just a month. Be right back. Two thousand years later. You also have two charms that directly affect your parry attack. Sugar and Whetstone. Sugar automatically does a parry for you when you jump and make contact with anything parryable. Again, I didn't find much use for this charm. There was only two levels in the entire game where I found it useful. The Phantom Express, where the entire fight takes place on this platform. You need to continuously move it by parrying these valves to avoid enemy attacks. 
and the King Dice boss fight, where you parry this dice to decide what part of the board you progress to. I'll talk about him later. The Whetstone Charm is actually quite useful, turning your parry attack into an axe, meaning that most enemies can be parried even if they're not the usual pink. This is most helpful if you need some airtime riding on enemies to avoid others below. So I wouldn't really use this outside run and gun stages as enemy projectiles still can't be parried, making it pretty much useless on boss fights. You can still technically use it on bosses, but there's not really much point. The damage is quite minute and it will usually end up with you taking a hit in return. Now we've got one more charm and this is easily the best of the lot. The smoke bomb enhances your dash ability, letting you go invisible during the dash, meaning that you can dash from one place to the next without taking any damage in between. This is without doubt the most overpowered charm, and although it's great, it makes all the other charms seem pretty much obsolete. I mean, would you want the ability to dash around like a ninja or an extra hit point? Ironically, the smoke bomb is only useless when it can't be used, like in the aerial battles, so then you should just replace it with something else. Now, initially, I used the smoke bomb just to avoid enemy projectiles, but the smoke dash isn't just a smoke dash. It's a smoke teleport, meaning you can actually bypass enemies entirely if you time it right. Seriously, if you go onto any Cuphead video on YouTube, I bet at least 9 out of 10 of the people playing the game will be using the smoke bomb. It just makes all other charms obsolete, which sounds great, but honestly, it's kind of a problem because by having something so overpowered in the game, you're bottlenecked into two choices purposely handicapping yourself by not using it or using it and making the game a hell of a lot easier. I'm not saying I don't like the concept of the smoke bomb, I think it's amazing, but in this situation I have to criticize it for actually being too effective, especially compared to the other charms. I probably wouldn't even be complaining if there wasn't such a huge divide between the applicability of them. Perfect organism. Its structural perfection is matched only by its hostility. I can't lie to you about your chances, but you have my sympathies. And finally, the top of Cuphead's catalogue of weapons, we have the Supers. Supers are special attacks that can be found throughout each world of Cuphead. They can't be bought from shops, however, you'll need to seek out these mausoleums, and inside, you'll have to stop ghosts from destroying this chalice. If you didn't pick up already, these ghosts are invulnerable to damage, because, you know, you've... You can't kill ghosts. So the next best thing is to parry them into oblivion. Once all the ghosts are defeated, the chalice will reward you with a super. There are three different super arts you can acquire in the game. Energy beam, invincibility, and giant ghost. Each of these can be used in game once you max out the super meter, which means filling all five of these cards. With energy beam, you fire out all your milky goodness onto the enemy in a focused direct attack that deals a ton of damage. <laughs> Invincibility, which is my personal favorite, grants five seconds of invulnerability. Five seconds doesn't sound like a lot, but if you combine it with the spread firing mode, you can hog your enemy carefree knowing you won't have to trade any damage. Just be sure to give yourself a second or two to get back somewhere safe, because being greedy with this super can be very punishing. Get out, get out, get out, get out! The final super art, Giant Ghost, I never really used too often. I found it more cumbersome than other supers. Makes sense, it's the last one you unlock canonically, but still... I found it more trouble than it was worth. When activated, you form a buff boy ghost version of yourself that spins around dealing damage to anything it comes in contact with. The problem is, the ghost doesn't control itself. You do. It's controlled by the player. If you move left, the ghost moves left, right makes the ghost go right, and so on. But let's say you move to the right and remain stationary. The ghost won't stop. It'll keep moving until he disappears off screen, where I assume Bill Murray catches him. 
And this is really bad if, say, you're fighting a boss and you need to watch your footing. So usually this ends up with you taking damage because you're essentially playing two characters at once. Your ghost also drops a heart at the end of its cycle, which you can parry. I thought this would give you an extra hit point back for all the trouble he's put you through, but no, nope, it just slightly fills up your super bar. Plus, half the time you actually can't get to this heart because it's too far away or an enemy's blocking it. Meaning you might have to take even more damage just to reach it for a slight increase to your super. So it really boils down to, are you going to pick a character that spawns another character and you have to control said character while maintaining the safety of your original character, then bringing that spawned character back to your original character just to fill up your super meter just a bit? Or are you going to take five seconds of no damage? This isn't even really a criticism, it's more of a preference. I'm sure that there are many players out there that have much better management than me and they can perform this juggling act. But for me, I'm happy with my five seconds of invulnerability. Now, although there are way too many bosses to speak about for this video, I just want to talk about a few bosses that really caught my attention. Dr. Cole's robot, or as I like to call him, the Iron Giant. There really isn't any boss like him in the game. The concept of the fight is genius, but it's executed quite poorly. Basically, most bosses in Cuphead, you shoot them to do damage, moving on to the next stage until you finally knock him out. With this guy, you have three possible areas to attack him and destroying each progresses the fight in a unique way. Destroying his laser, he starts firing nuts and bolts out of his mouth. Destroy his chest and he'll start using his hands to either hit you or pull him towards you with a magnet. And lastly, destroying his gut gets rid of these space invader looking asses and gives you black bombs that home in towards you. And also they have a massive explosion radius to boot. It's a shame that when you get past this initial part of the boss fight, it just devolves into dodging projectiles. Oh, look at this guy. He changes from a blue to a red crystal. What does it do? Nothing. I guess they tried to catch someone off who was colorblind. I don't know, man. <sighs> okay, I'm about to put on these glasses uh, that are going to cure my colorblindness for the first time in my life. Grim Matchstick is another fantastic boss, but definitely more style over substance. This is the first boss you fight canonically on moving platforms where there's no ground below, and this brings an extra level of difficulty into the game. Some of that difficulty is straight up unfair, but that's something I'll talk about later on. Going from chasing him and being the hunter, for him to pull a complete 180 chasing you, making you the hunted, is just great. Not to mention when he enters his final stage, just when you think you've killed him waiting for that that knockout prompt to appear on screen. Then he just grows stronger with the background taking a tonal shift as well. It's great stuff. I'm probably over reading this fight a bit too much, but I do have this bus ingrained into my head as I'm sure it's the one I died the most to, giving me that special love-hate relationship towards him. One problem I had with this fight was the fireball attack on its final stage. Unlike most projectiles, you can actually fire at this thing, destroying it, splitting it up into four separate shots. But they can sometimes delay or not just register your hit at all, meaning you destroy them but still take the damage. Kala Maria is also one to mention. Her fight is varied with a lot of cool mechanics. She has a tendency to indirectly damage the player using the environment to her advantage, in this case, the ocean itself. God, I bet she gives good suck. For example, when she has a group of eels gang up on you, she'll never actually attack the player, but instead use a Medusa-like stone freezing ability, making the player unable to move for a few seconds. This could be circumvented by mashing the buttons to free yourself sooner. Wait, did you say freeing yourself by mashing buttons? Uh, th 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 there's a game that did that actually, it's called Dark. I really like this fight. A lot of bosses in general summon minions to attack you, but Cala Maria trying to hinder you in a non-damaging way is an interesting concept, much like the magnet from Junkyard Jive. And finally, King Dice. C can you all stop comparing me to him, please? It's not funny at this point. This boss was definitely an experiment, and I'm fairly happy with the results. You're put on a gambling table, and King Dice hands you a die that you have to pack to land on either one, two, or three. Looking at the board, you have spaces where you fight bosses. Save spaces as well, and... <laughs> 
start over. Each of the bosses you fight here are accompanied by these beautiful backdrops changing as the fight goes on. Keep in mind, these aren't really bosses, more like boss juniors. That's somewhere in between an actual boss and a mini boss. They have somewhat similar health to a boss, but their attacks are much more avoidable. This is basically an endurance run, trying to get to the end of the board to beat King Dice. Each of these boss battles, including King Dice, are nothing of note. Seriously, this fight is just parrying at the right time, and even that can be cheesed. But combining this entire collection of bosses into one stage is fantastic. Keeping in mind if you die at any point on this board, you gotta start all the way over. There's no checkpoints. Raising the tension, and you finally feel like you're making that climb of progression. The progression I talked about earlier, and I wish the game had more moments like this, when you finally beat the guy, and you feel like you've just climbed a mountain. You know when Samurai Jack finally killed a coup? That's at least 75% of what this felt like to me. Oh no. You're probably wondering when I'm gonna bring up the devil's fight, the climactic end of the game. I'm not. The boss is actually fairly underwhelming. Not a bad boss fight, but it's basically a bar of chocolate someone's already taken a bite out of. And it was probably King Dice. Now, if they switched it up and had King Dice as the final boss, they gave him his own fight and not just that single attack that he has, this would have been a great send-off to the game. The Devil's boss fight is good, more serviceable, just not an amazing boss fight. I like the fact that when you beat him halfway, he'd do a cop-out and transition you to another level where you're to fight a bigger form of himself, but it really just boiled down to balancing on platforms, avoiding mobs, and shooting one of the biggest hitboxes in this entire game. Oh, and plus you made him cry. It's probably because you beat up that onion. Overall, I love the bosses in this game. Some definitely work better than others though. But I never felt two bosses looked the same. They all brought their own flair to the fight. Sure, some enemies do have attack patterns that are extremely similar, but that's worthy of a pass when each is so memorable and distinguished. Each of the boss battles can be played in one of two difficulties, simple and regular. Simple is, what the name suggests, a simplified version of the boss fight. It'll usually skip an entire stage of the boss fight, cutting the time to beat it in half. I don't suggest playing the game through simple difficulty because you won't get the full experience and the game does actually cut you off near the end, making you unable to complete the game unless you play the rest in at least regular. I know a lot of people have complained about this as well, it's essentially what they used to do in old games, where you completed a part of the game on an easier difficulty and it refused to let you pass. This is an incredibly common trope in old games. I could see why people would complain, but honestly, I think you just gotta put your big boy pants on and tackle it on regular. You're getting the full experience there and you're gathering more knowledge as you play, making the game more manageable as you progress. It's got an incredibly steep learning curve, hear me out, but it'll definitely be worth your time. And when you beat the game, best the devil and burn or all the soul contracts freeing all the inhabitants of Inkwell Isle, you complete the game and also unlock expert difficulty mode. Bosses here move much faster. Sometimes they even have unique attack animations not seen before. As previously playing through the game, you could only get up to an A rank, which levels the game out to 100%. I actually thought 100% was the highest rating you could get, but then when I checked my data screen and saw that I was over 100%, I realized what I had to do. It's really nice that even though you complete the game, there's still more stuff to do, pushing those completionists to their capacity. Well, listen here, mate. I got all the achievements in Dark Souls 3, and the orange box. That, that, they are the only two games I need to 100%, all right? Now, although I love Cuphead to Bits, there is something I wanted to talk about. Something dark. Unspeakable. The RNG system. Straight up, Cuphead has a horrible RNG system. This essentially means that enemy placement, enemy attacks, and even the platforms you balance yourself on are pretty much random. Sure, there's some consistency. You're not launching a Minecraft world and hoping for the idyllic world you dreamed of. Pretty much every game has RNG to some extent, and that's totally fine. It's a necessity in the video game industry. In Worms, a timed explosive may or may not go off. That's because of RNG. Sometimes an enemy may miss their shot on you. That's because of RNG. A boss may do one attack instead of another. 
further, that's because of RNG. On the soft side, RNG changes up the playing field, leaving you wondering what the next move will be. But on the harder end, it's black and white between you getting your attack or being killed. As a rule of thumb, usually the harder a game is, the more polish an RNG system needs to be. In a shooter where you can soak up damage like a sponge and health is either auto-regenerating or close by, RNG isn't as focused on because who cares if you can take a few shots when you can basically get the health back seconds later. Compare that to a game like, yeah, and I'm so sorry for doing this, Dark Souls, where death can be delivered in a single blow by RNG. But because the developers are aware of this, they focus so heavily on making sure it's as fair as possible, even though it's random. Mostly by making attacks telegraphed, so you know what attack is coming and what direction. So first time players can see an attack coming, and returning players know the exact attack and what time they need to dodge. Cuphead does not have a polished RNG system. Honestly, it's pretty god awful and easily the worst thing about this otherwise fantastic game. One of the best examples of bad RNG is the grim matchstick boss battle. As I mentioned before, the battle takes place in the sky, so instead of being on solid ground, you jump around on clouds. The clouds are made of dead YouTube channels. The problem is the clouds follow a rule of RNG, and this can lead to some points in the battle where clouds will spawn far away from the player, or just straight up not spawn at all. Meaning in some scenarios, you have to just straight up take damage just to proceed. This isn't just something you can sweep under the rug either. Fairness is critical in a game like Cuphead, where you can only take three hits before dying, or five. If you're a pussy. This is one of the worst examples, but you can feel this wave ripple throughout the entire game. Sometimes you'll make it to the end of a level because an enemy didn't appear, sometimes you won't because they did. And RNG isn't just an after effect haunting the game's code, it's been purposely manipulated by the devs. Jimmy the Grey is a boss you fight on the second island of the game. This can be an easy or difficult fight depending entirely on RNG. Jimmy opens up with one of three possible boss phases. Haunted swords that are painfully easy to dodge, sphinx cats that are also fairly easy to avoid, and then the curse chest. <laughs> This chest throws tons of treasure at you, hard to avoid, and sometimes not even being fair with its damage. That was not worth grabbing. What the f was that? Now, if all three of these opening attacks were similar in difficulty, there wouldn't be a problem. But they're not. You have two easy opening attacks and then a difficult one. This isn't the only boss either. Right next to Jimmy's arena is Baroness Von Bonbon. But before you fight her and the diabetic child of Monster House, you have to take on three out of four possible mini bosses just to be able to fight her. This can either be a jawbreaker, candy corn, waffle, cupcake, or a gumball machine. The jawbreaker is painfully easy. It follows you in a slow pattern, making it easy to avoid. On top of that, the death animation is the longest by far, giving you the most time to take a breather before the next stage. The candy corn is a step up, following a pattern of hugging the edges of the screen, then transitioning in the middle, all while spitting out smaller corn, or as I like to call them, candy children. They flow up to the top of the screen. Again, not too difficult, but definitely requires more attention. The waffle flies around quickly in a circular motion. On top of that as well, he'll explode, sending eight pieces of waffle to each side of the screen. A lot of attention is needed for these attacks. The cupcake will jump and land, leaving behind a wave of icing in either direction, taking up a huge amount of the arena. And finally, the gumball machine. Even though he only takes up a small section of the area, he spews out gumballs continuously, needing your full attention as if any of these makes contact with you, you'll take damage. Now the the problem isn't with the bosses alone, but the fact that they're subject to the RNG system, meaning there is an equal chance that any of these mini bosses will spawn at once in the three bus slots available before you take on Baroness Von Bonbon. And that isn't even the problem. It's a good system that encourages replayability. The problem is with every mini bus defeated, the screen becomes more cluttered. Killed the jawbreaker. Well, out comes the gumball machine and also tiny jelly beans because you just progress to the next stage of the fight. 
Killed the gumball machine. Well, here comes the waffle with more jelly beans and as well, we'll throw in the Baroness herself firing at you. Bet you wish you had that jawbreaker to fight now, right? It's actually reached the point where speedrunners cheese the game by reloading a level if they didn't get the opening stage they wanted. Restarting levels because they're fighting an early boss or difficult attack pattern too early. Now, I know a lot of people are gonna say, get good. But this isn't the case of learning the attacks, even getting a better firing mode or charm. With this boss, you're a total victim to the RNG system and it can be easy or hard depending on total luck. When I got the top ranks on some bosses and P for pacifist in the run and gun sections, a lot of the time I didn't feel congratulated, I just felt that I got off lucky. That the algorithm was in my favour, which really defeats the point of taking on such a high challenge. Now I just want to say again, I love Cuphead. I think it's a very important game that should be remembered for years to come. I know it kind of looks like I'm pummeling the game right now over very minor stuff, but a lot of people seem to overlook these glaring flaws, mainly because they're too busy focusing on the fantastic art style and music. And hey buddy, I totally agree with you. The music is fantastic. How I was listening to it while editing this video, and the art style is reviving something old and bringing it into the new generation, a move that I totally respect. And ironically, it's actually got me hooked on some 30s cartoons right now. But if a game has a problem, it needs to be addressed, no matter how amazing its presentation is. Cuphead as a character is incredibly responsive, and for the most part, every death felt like it was my own fault, not the game's. And after beating the game, I had this huge dumbass smile on my face because I wanted to go back and get the S ranks. I want to master the game and all its bosses, and that hook of replayability is getting increasingly rare. So for Cuphead to drag me back is just astounding. If you really want to enjoy Cuphead, I'd suggest playing each level at least three times. The first time to get an overall feel for the level or the boss. The second to precisely learn every enemy's attack patterns or the boss's attack patterns. And third to not focus on surviving, but the level itself, how it's animated, and how the backgrounds contrast with it. I know I'm sounding like an art house boy right now, but I didn't even realize how well these guys were animated until watching the footage back after recording because I was too busy focusing on surviving. I was also pleasantly surprised to see the Unity logo at the end of the game's credits like it was some kind of reverse joke. Hear me out, the Unity engine is a great tool. It's created games like Superheart, Hearthstone, and Kerbal Space Program. But because of its easy accessibility, loads of people have opened up their own chum buckets spewing out constant garbage. The game isn't even theirs, they'll just buy a bunch of random game assets and stick them in the game, hoping to turn a profit. And because of this reason, Unity has a lot of bad association towards it, but it's really nice to see a game like Cuphead rise from the rubble, giving Unity a lot of that much needed respect back. Also, after watching this video, please go onto Studio MDHR's YouTube channel and just look at the animation process for this game. Or even the music, it'll make you empathize with the talent put into this game. These people cared deeply about their craft. <laughs> Cuphead is a great game. I want to go back as soon as I finish this video to get those P ranks and those S ranks. The game may not be accessible to everyone, whether that's the difficulty or the RNG aspect, but its style and art is something everyone's got to appreciate firsthand. It'll kick your ass, sometimes fair, other times not, but overall, Cuphead is worth your time. Now, assuming this is a review. <laughs> You're probably wondering what number I'm going to give it out of 5, out of 10, out of 100. Well, here we go, boys. There's just so much game here to mess around with and enjoy. And if you've ever been a fan that got burnt out in the franchise, or are finally looking to jump in for the first time, there's no finer point than Black Ops 2. For more on Call of Duty, Black Ops 2, keep it at IGN. Now, I know what you're all thinking. Is the Cuphead fandom worse than the Rick and Morty fandom? 
grenades! There seems to be this trend of video games becoming extremely successful, and its success usually cultivates a massive following. And as we all know, the larger the following, the larger the sum of all of its parts. And now cup sonas seem to be a thing. Don't, don't you just love people? I mean, that's fine. Again, man, you do you. All I'm saying is, if there's heart of it, there's gonna be NSFW of it. You know it. At this point, the fandom hasn't reached critical. We're more talking about a DEFCON 2. The nuclear fallout is probably coming, but we're safe for the time being. I'll turn that back. We're going to DEFCON 1. Bendy, Five Nights at Freddy's, and games even outside the jump scare genre like Undertale all seem to fall into this chasm of bad fandoms, never to be seen again. Much like any movement, though, it's not the actual majority that's garbage, not these entire fan bases that are bad. It's just how vocal the garbage minority are. Ironically, the fandom itself is probably the least offensive part of Cuphead's following. The worst aspect is something much more evil. The mainstream. Imagine a world where you couldn't finish a sentence without adding an emoji. That, my friends, is the mainstream. And from the mainstream comes hype culture, the ability to make a game popular and slam it down pretty much within the same day. Remember No Man's Sky? How much hype that game got, even though Sean Murray was more dishonest than Patches. Will you be able to play with your friends? Yeah. Can you grief other players? <laughs> a little bit. Now, even though No Man's Sky was a bad game, or at least incredibly mismarketed and misled by Sean Murray, the hype around the game brought it all the way up into the heavens with praise. Now, obviously, the main difference is here, Cuphead is actually a good, competent game. It wasn't mismarketed with a man telling fallacies every second sentence. But hype culture as a whole has that ability to turn a bunch of adoring fans into people non-stop complaining about a game. Because they were blinded by its magnificence to begin with, then slowly realizing the cracks the game has. I do like this game, Cuphead. But I, I just think it's a bit overrated. Alright. I, I did give it a 10 out of 10, you see. All right. Yes, a, a glowing review on Steam saying it's the, the, the best game of our generation. <laughs> so now I'm going to give it a negative review because it led me astray, you see. Well, you don't realise you are dense, right? No, 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 the, the game lied to me. It blinded me, you see. Well, why not just write another review when you're actually honest about the game's criticisms? No, 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 that, that, that would be dishonest. But by the way, have you seen my cup sona? Her name's Chan Quantel. Their pronouns are mug and cup. Going back to the review section, this is why I was so critical of the game. Because a lot of people seem to be blinded by Cuphead's amazing art style and music, ignoring the real problems with the game mechanically. So I'll boil it down to the No Man's Sky effect with the amazing click of video game journalists. Rushing to make articles saying, The, 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 game, the game was what we thought it was. Or, Cuphead was overrated? Using weasel sentences like, some could have said, or people have said. You've probably noticed the little Dark Souls references I've sprinkled across this video. That's because these same people compare Dark Souls to everything. Everything is the X of Dark Souls. Super Mario Odyssey is the platformer of Dark Souls. B-Movie is the movie of Dark Souls. Dark Souls is the Dark Souls of Dark Souls. Sometimes you have to kill the monsters. Moving away from the external stuff, the devs themselves can accidentally cast themselves into the exact same pit. And that is called fan servicing. Games like FNAF weren't ruined by the mainstream alone, it was the negligence from the developer's own part. A negligence to change anything and just keep churning out the same stuff over and over to pander to the masses. Nothing's wrong with capitalizing on a niche, hear me out, pretty much every YouTuber on this site that has a series title go viral will then try to replicate said title in future videos hoping to bring some consistent views to the channel. But it's that haphazard attitude of just riding the wave without actually trying Trying to control it, it's an easy game to start, but incredibly difficult to maintain. There's usually this narrative bridge where a game's story and overall universe is shaped by the developers, and when it crosses that bridge, 
it stops being led by the developers and more by the fan base. Which isn't a bad thing, there are many games with purposely vague lore, making the player base read into it and interpret it in their own way, with breadcrumbs left around as either notes or audio recordings. Now thankfully Cuphead doesn't have this narrative, it's a simple game where you beat bosses and get to the end. And the self-awareness the game has with this concept and its art style, it's like you're playing a Saturday morning cartoon. So thankfully I think this game is safe from channels trying to make mountains out of a molehill because that's really not the point of this game. That should be left to games that want to be interpreted, that ask you to interpret them. Games that are vague on purpose. Cuphead is fun, the characters are fun, the gameplay is fun, the whole game is fun. It doesn't have this complex lore or narrative that needs to be interpreted. Honestly, Cuphead is a whole experience. It doesn't even really need a sequel, even though it probably will because the amount of copies it sold. The game has a beginning and it has an end. It's incredibly conclusive. And if you want more than that, then there's more to explore and look around on the aisle. I'm sure there's some ranks that you've missed. We don't want to know the link between Cuphead and Dark. Oh god, he's gonna do it. He's gonna do it. I swear to God, he's gonna do it. No, I don't want to go on a White Knight rampage, but in short, form your own opinions. Experience the game for yourself. If you think it's a great game, power to you. If you think it's a bad game, be vocal about your opinions, but be sure you know what you're saying and you've done proper research. But one thing is a fact, Studio MDHR put their heart and soul into this game and it has paid off. And for that, they have my full respect because these are clearly people that, even though it was a painstaking process, they enjoyed it nonetheless. We want Cuphead to age like a fine wine, something to remember about video games and how style can stand out. Not Alex Jones going on about how Cuphead has infected the minds of the youth, even though that'd be pretty funny. Scanning, control, manipulate scientific data, take over, blast, control, world government, shut down infrastructure, ship everything to China, just look at this person. Thank you for making it to the end of this video. In all honesty, it's probably about 30 of you. As I'm sure half the people didn't even click on this video because they saw the length, and the other half clicked off within the first minute because it wasn't about Jake Paul. And if you're wondering about my mic quality, I'm recording this segment with an Xbox Live headset. I forgot to record an outro, and I've packed my mic away, so I thought I'd just whip this thing out because I really care about the quality of my content. Now, you're probably wondering why I was gone for a month. This is the longest time I haven't uploaded. A lot of people have had their own game theories, the majority of them saying that I am chronically depressed. Now, although that may be true, that isn't the reason why I haven't uploaded for the past month. I've been incredibly busy, and on top of that as well, I've been kind of stuck in a creative rut. This is what happened with my Petscop video. I make content, and then I get really bored of my content. So, at that point, you've got one of two choices. Keep making the same content until it becomes even more redundant, and you genuinely want to off yourself. Or, you take a step back, Take a breather, and then come back with something new and fresh. Now, I'm not saying this video is the second coming of Christ. In fact, there's probably a lot of things wrong with this video. The pacing wasn't the best, and I'm very sure I overcomplicated some parts of the game while completely neglecting other parts. But please keep in mind, this is my very first review of a game. I have never reviewed a game in my entire life. So with that being said, I hope you enjoyed it. I didn't want to just make a quick little IGN 5 minute review and then give it a, a 9 or 10 out of 10 at the end of the video. I really wanted to dedicate this video looking into the game itself, its mechanics, and what I enjoyed and what I didn't. A lot of this is thanks to Shami, a very good friend of mine, and he makes incredible game reviews that are also very in-depth, definitely better than mine. So if you enjoyed this video even just a little bit, be sure to check out his channel as well. They'll be a lot better paced. They won't talk about... <laughs> <laughs> and I know I also spent a very small part of the video talking about the fandom and the external factors. I wasn't even really going to include that part in the video, but I felt like it needed to be said because game fandoms are always a constant topic thanks to the explosion of the Rick and Morty fandom. Hey Morty, Morty, I'm Pickle Rick! And of course you've got video game journalists comparing everything to Dark Souls. It physically hurts. Please stop doing that. But yeah, overall, I hope you enjoyed the video. I will be uploading again soon. It's not going to be a month gap, don't worry. I'm just kind of not sure what content to make at the moment. I'm throwing this out there. I've spent a good 
two weeks on it, hoping that you guys enjoy it and it brings something new. And if it's enjoyed to an extent, I could definitely make content like this in the future. Because although this was definitely incredibly intensive and stressful to make, I'm mostly happy with the end result. And hopefully you are as well. So yeah, that's the end of the video. I'm not sure how to conclude it. So I'm just going to read a Max Payne quote. They were all dead. dead. The, the final gunshot was an exclamation mark on everything that had led to this point. I released my finger from the trigger. Also, stop comparing me to King Dog.